the South African Communications Union. And with me is Jock Skwokman. He's also from the Communications Work with uh, South African Communications Union. And um, we would like to thank Ikasa and the House for uh, the opportunity to present this view from SAPCO. In short, we've submitted this to the Ikasa as requested, as indicated on the Ikasa website. And um, it's just some little anomaly, maybe. That's I think Newtel likes what you're going to say here because they also submitted it under their name. Just telling you guys there's a little glitch on your <coughs> website. So our submission is under the name of Newtel. Thank you for that, we'll rectify that. <laughs> yeah, we organize mostly in Telcom and the Total Facilities Management Company in South Africa as well as Mulapu, Besmet, Debus, as well as we have membership in the broader market. And we feel that we do have an interest in this issue of decision making. So um, our submission, uh, South African Communications Union, is a, a registered trade union that is affiliated with the Federation of Unions of South Africa, organising in the communication and the information technology industry. We therefore believe that we are very familiar with the nature of telecommunications regulation as it has evolved in South Africa and is knowledgeable about the strengths and the weaknesses. We've welcomed because of strategic review of the telecommunications because we believe that it's essential that the ITC develops at an early age, uh, early stage in its operation and overall vision of the for the future of telecommunication regulation against which it can benchmark particular policies and decisions. This will provide more predictability and consistency for the ICT industry and is more likely to produce a regulation that is proactive, not reactive. We have found that the ICASA consultation local loop unbundling document, which refers to ICASA's framework for introducing local loop unbundling discussion paper for public comment, lacks something of an overarching narrative and does not set the context for the detailed questions it poses. In our view, the record of approximately 15 years of telecoms competition in South Africa is not a qualified success. Unquestionably, competition has resulted in more consumer choice. Prices are flat and quality of services has not improved significantly to justify further liberalization. Increased competition does not always result in advances, advances in technology. The obsession with promoting network competition <coughs> has had negative consequences for capital investment and led to the duplication of infrastructure and not produce the desired level of innovative services on the network. It's resulted in huge job losses and very few jobs have been created as a result of liberalization. Because of regulations has not always been detailed. Contrary to early expectations of phasing down of interventions, this is persistent and costly feature of the telecommunications scene. There has been a lack of regulatory strategy and insufficient focus on creating a world-class national broadband infrastructure to enhance the international competitiveness of ITC in South Africa. We have a new opportunity with a new Electronic Communications Act and the regulator ICASA has new duties. During the implementation <coughs> passage of the Electronic Communications Act and specifically the local loop unbundling, we need to campaign not just to consumers but all South Africans. The local loop unbundling is the first real opportunity for the regulator to strike a new and appropriate balance between the interests of the public South Africa and the consumers. While the narrower interests of consumers might suggest the provision of maximum competition, the broader interest of the South African public requires more consultation, innovation and investment. Local loop and bundling, to use the terminology of the consultation document, is not an easy and obvious one. 
We need a new settlement in telecoms re regulation. Therefore, our responses to the specific questions posed by ICASA with the implementation of the local loop and bundling in the local loop and bundling document are to be shaped by the broad principles which we believe should underline telecommunications regulation over the next few years. The local loop and bundling regulation should take account of the interests of those who work in the industry and need to work with trade unions to secure skills and training at the highest levels and promote decent labour standards and practices throughout the ITC industry. The local loop and bundling regulation should support the delivery of strategic needs of South African public as a whole. The local loop regulation should focus less on attempting to promote network competition but more on securing the necessary investment in the network design to facilitate universal access and production for the new innovative products and services. Local loop unbundling regulations should be based on telecommunications as a global market and not simply a South African one. Local loop regulation should be less communication sector specific and more generic with more reliance on competition act and move towards a strategic model that promotes investment, innovation and the development in the network. The local loop unbundling regulation should be less tactical and intrusive, more strategic and enabling. The local loop unbundling regulation must deliver effective funding arrangements for universal access to ever increasing bandwidth speeds and ensure that minimum standards on quality of service are maintained throughout the ICT sector. The local loop and bundling regulation should be less mechanistic, more humanistic, empowering workers in the ITC sector and creating sustainable employment. The local loop and bundling regulation should take account of the interest of those who work in the industry and not the exclusive interest of that of operators in business. Take in consideration that the local un un unbundling must weigh heavily on job creation in a fast involving industry. We need to act responsible in driving the vision and the way forward of our South African government with our skills development. Now the question we've got there, is ICASA's proposed approach to unbundling the local loop through the implementation of the facilities leasing regulations reasonable, feasible and acceptable? It would be technically and organizationally extremely difficult to define and implement. It's a simple matter to state that the local loop should be unbundled, as we heard this morning, from the main network. But giving precision to such unbundling would be immensely complicated and require very clear lines to be drawn. Furthermore, if one could make a clean, rational and workable division between the local loops and the network, we must ensure that such a division <coughs> would remain appropriate. Geographical diversity and technological change to cite an example of local loop unbundling, sub-loop unbundling would soon render any dividing line inappropriate. The local loop unbundling could then become a continual one where about where the line should be drawn. This could lead to divergence of effort away from the key issues of investing in new networks and services and meeting our consumer needs. Even if the local loop of bundling was implemented by the current incumbent, we talked about Telcom SA, if this could be achieved technically, the South African government, being the main shareholder, would find it extremely difficult to supplement the shareholder dividend that is paid by Telcom SA. It is one thing to contemplate local loop unbundling of the incumbent operator when it's partially owned by the South African government and indirectly the South African population as well as institutional and small shareholders with no obvious consumer gain. <coughs> local loop unbundling would undermine foreign investment and innovation in the fixed line network 
In the periods 2007 and 2009, saw a collapse in the investor confidence and in capital availability for the telecommunications global prevalence. Slowly confidence and investment are starting to return at present. The uncertainties surrounding local income bundling and the difficulty in ensuring an adequate return on risky investment would reduce the flow of capital to the ITC industry. If local loops were unbundled and entirely separated from the backbone network, there would be less incentive to innovate, upgrade and invest in the fixed, town, fixed line network, since the incumbent itself would not gain directly from such an innovation and investment. Local loop unbundling would delay significantly the rollout of the universal access and broadband services. South Africa is now doing well in broadband terms and Telkom SA is at the heart of this relative success. Fixed line affordable service, ADSL broadband subscribers, now number around 760,000. However, if ICASA was to enforce the local loop unbundling upon fixed line operators, it will be effectively slowing down broadband rollout, we're talking about fixed line ADSL. To make local loop unbundling work, Telcom SA would be restructured and re engineered of the operational systems and processes of the entire access network and local switching facilities and it will lead to job losses, innumerable job losses. <coughs> Now if we go look at the options as il illustrated by ICASA. Bitstream, shared loop unbundling, whole loop unbundling, and then sub loop unbundling. <coughs> I view that none of these unbundling option models has been shown to work anywhere else in the global ITC industry or arena. If ICASA adopts any local loop unbundling model, it would venture down uncertain roads. It would be reassuring to have international experience to show that local loop unbundling is feasible and effective, but there's no such experience. To pursue network separation in such circumstances is to promote hope over experience. The world leader in broadband provisioning at the moment is South Korea. South Korea has reached this position through the very model that advocates local loop unbundling wish to overturn, namely a vertically integrated incumbent. The timing of local loop unbundling is premature given the slow pace of global economic recovery. Now a case in point there, in the early 1980s when British Telecom communications market was liberalized by the government, it was decided that the best means of promoting competition was to support alternative infrastructures and interconnection between competing networks. It did not choose to take the route of local loop unbundling. Investors were invited to purchase British Telecom or back its competitors on that basis. Now we're coming back to South Africa, we say in 1991, Telcom SA was formed as a company. Telcom SA was later listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange and the New York Stock Exchange. Investors were invited to purchase Telcom SA in the form of shareholding. Thereafter, the Electronic Communications Act was promulgated, promulgated that, paid, that paved the way for promoting competition within the ITC in South Africa. <coughs> Alternative infrastructures were built by Newtel. Interconnection fees were regulated between competing network operations. To introduce local loop unbundling now would be a complete reversal of policy and the betrayal of investors, customers and employees for no good reason. In short, ICASA has no cogent arguments that will support local loop unbundling implementation. It's time to put the local loop unbundling issue to bed, concentrate on increasing investment and choice 
and rolling out enhanced and new services to all geographic areas within South Africa. Now the question we have is what form of local loop and bundling do stakeholders realistically favour in the South African market? Subtle submission, in our view. Historically, ICASA has put too much emphasis on attempting to create network competition. This has resulted in the duplications of investment, surplus transmission capacity, and in some corporate crisis, and is in danger of undermining future investments. We believe that it would be better to focus on service competition, providing more rapid and more innovative offerings to consumers. The regulatory focus should shift from competition between networks to the creation of greater choice and reliability of services and to higher up the content, volume and wholesale chain. What other costs items should be included in each form of local loop and bundling? Should a standardized ordering and specification system be developed? In the event that an access line deficit is identified, would you be willing to contribute to an access line deficit recovery scheme? Our submission is there should be overall competition. However, it's not sustainable to have masses of underutilized pipes in the ground. In the context of evolving products and services, the civil infrastructure should therefore be considered passive. Regulation and competition technologies have weakened the incumbent grip on the last mile and are heavily impacting on its voice revenues which have traditionally accounted for the significant <coughs> part of its total revenues and profits. A key question to ICASA is how will infrastructure be maintained and developed if the incumbent ICASA has continuously destroyed universal services. This has severely weakened the access to affordable telephony to rural communities. While the, mo while the mobile market is generally competitive at the retail entry, ICASA is right to address the issue of call termination charges. However, we would question the merits and justification of the access line deficit. This is a direct surcharge on fixed line users to subsidize mobile users, but with no equivalent to fixed line users. However, effective and sustainable competition is not simply about having a choice of network operator or service provider. It's also about consumers having easy and understandable access to information on prices and quality, which is both transparent and comparable. Consumers are bewildered by the range of choice and complexity of tariff structures. In our view, empowerment of consumers is as important as a provision of choice. This does not necessarily mean that the range of choice should be taken away from the consumer by ICASA in a drive to improve broadband access. Rather, the emphasis should be on ease of access to and clear presentation of information on the choices available. We consider it is an important part of informed consumer choice that easily comparable information be readily available. Consumers must be able to look at price and quality of service together if they are to make a truly informed choice. Noting the slow pace of broadband Lorola in South Africa, what are the regulatory implications of such growth? In part, the speed of take-up of broadband depends on the regulatory process itself. It's important that ICASA does not inhibit the costly investments in the technologies which are making broadband ever uh, broadband available to ever more homes. However, so far, most of those who have actually taken up broadband were analog to ADSL conversions. They were customers that already had service, they just converted. Consumers are using broadband to do essentially the same things they did with dial-up connections but with the convenience of an always-on connection, a flat rate subscription and faster speed. Substantial take-up of broadband requires such an option provides new 
compelling services and or content to drive consumer demand. In terms of digital content, is there sufficient capacity for digital content providers to develop new innovative services and take the risk in the investment? The current available bandwidth capacity may provide a bottleneck to the growth of broadband services. The availability of voice over IP on broadband should be the first of such driver. To date regulation has not been effective in the contributing to the delivery of such services or content. Rapid growth will be influenced by the freedom to recoup investments in areas of development and re deployment of innovative products and services. The impact of the Employee Achter Electronic Communication Act limited, limits the potential to secure a return on high-risk investment, will therefore directly influence the growth in broadband take-up. It's imperative, therefore, that ICASA should not try to foresee or determine a market. If take-up of voice over IP services become substantial, as we think, then regulation can be scaled back, except there will be considerations in the respect of universal service obligation. In the event of competing broadband platforms which technologies are most likely to be used, these are hard questions to answer because technology, technological developments are so difficult to predict. However, in our view, ICASA should work on the assumption that there will be competing broadband platforms, both fixed DSL and mobile 3G and LTE, both wired optic fiber and WiMAX and Wi-Fi wireless networks. What the operators are most likely to deploy is a basket of differing technologies best suited for the location, density and type of customers. Therefore, the regulator should not base decisions on assumptions about the availability on any particular technology or platform, on any particular timetable. Instead, it should endeavor to create a climate which promotes technological innovation and market experimentation. Also, it should address the issue of interoperability between all such networks. Although its existing technology, if sustainable or if it can be allowed to be the return on investment on fiber to the premises, will be a significant development providing a step increase in available bandwidth. Will local loop unbundling increase the demand for broadband services based on ICASA assumptions? How will such infrastructure be supplied? The experience of countries like Korea, Singapore, Japan suggests that there will be a demand for broadband services and that the current bandwidth in South Africa will be found inadequate. In the residential marketplace, the future probably lies in bandwidth and demand. For example, consumers will purchase bandwidth based on a daily use. IP networks are much more flexible than PSTN and should be capable of providing enhanced services. Once again, this is a cost-benefit analysis for operators in terms of rate of return in what may be a risky investment or has a longer pickup term. This may be influenced by ICASA and consumer demand by topography and market segmentation. The impact of the local income bundling on investment decisions in telecom in South Africa, competition does not necessarily promote investment. Excessive initial costs can slow down infrastructure investment. The startup cost of Newtel is a case in point. Since telecommunications is a global industry, investment in the sector is influenced by international factors. As a general rule, however, investment is maximized when a regulator in CASA is stable and predictable and reasonable in return can then be confidently expected on investment. The CASA should be cautious with regard to the new markets and should not try to predict and determine outcomes. The CASA should not seek to create artificial markets except in relation to the interest of the universal service obligation. In conclusion, we need to empower consumers to make informed choices 
through the provision of information that will permit meeting meaningful comparisons of cost and quality of service. <coughs> the Electronic Commun Communication Act and Local Look on Bundling should focus more on service, choice and reliability rather than network competition. ICASA must adopt a strategic framework sufficiently clear and stable to encourage substantial network investments and to permit a fair return on these investments. Above all, we need ICASA to provide a clear <coughs> vision of how electronic communications regulation will evolve so that it becomes less intrusive <coughs> and tactical and more predictable and strategic and delivers to in South Africa wherever the geographical, social or economical location. Now if we just stress further what I was talking about, the local loop regulation. This is our view. Remember that we labor intensive, we are South African Communication Union. We work in a we we um, are in a labor intensive market. And we feel that local loop and bundling will be very detrimental to the fixed line operator, whereas the, the other operators, as we heard this morning as well, wants to define and interpret what does local loop and bundling mean. So we would ask in CASA also just to be firm on that fact that local loop and bundling is not just the unbundling of a copper network. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Esther, I'll start. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Saku, for that uh, submission, which is noted. May Saku please provide their views of the legal requir requirement of the ECA for access providers to lease local loop facilities to access uh, seekers through Chapter 8 and the facilities leasing Just know that I'm not a subject matter expert or on, on, on that. But I will need to answer any questions that we are able to direct. Can we just ask you as a 40 minutes? Sure. Well, I think that the, what we were asking there is that uh, if one looks at Chapter 8, the facilities leasing chapter in the ECA, they, uh, the, the, it, it suggests that um, access to the local loop is already available through uh, the facilities leasing uh, uh, processes and that what we're now looking at here is our best to make that happen in practice. Um, so I just wanted to comment on, on that uh, because in a sense we're not debating whether we should uh, introduce a view with how best to do it. And, and my question is going to be uh, if we look at say the MWeb uh, submission. They're saying that uh, for them the best way to introduce LLU is to start with Bitstream. So my question, and then uh, later on we can look at shared and full down the road. So my question really is, uh, what is what is Saku's view on that? Would you accept a situation where uh, one starts the LLU process through uh, Bitstream, or do you think that all forms are, should just be shouldn't happen at all. Mr. Chair, Swapu's view on that would be um, the facilities leasing. There are agreements in place already where uh, the seekers do have access to the telecoms network. They can't be leasing and their agreements are doing fine. With regard to the four different means of local loop and bundling, we don't see it working in South Africa. Well, could you say why Bitstream would not work here when it's, uh, you've got IP Connect in place? Isn't that uh, heading towards Bitstream? Can I direct <coughs> you on that question in 14 days?
in your submission, you are concerned about job losses. Now, ADSL take-up rates have jumped dramatically over the last few years. With the IPC type product introduced, ADSL type products have jumped again dramatically. So there's an increased demand, at least for those existing employees that exist within Telcom. Uh, companies using the IPC product have had to employ more staff. You didn't have a web as it stands. You didn't have FMB Connect as it stands. They employ people. Um, is it not foreseeable to say that enhanced services in that arena, say especially in a bitstream product, that more jobs would be created both for telecom and for the, the access seekers? So with respect, we need to get to the answer of the network operators whether they are willing to uh, um, jump in with the local urban bundling and come to the table. Now, we haven't got that answer yet. Now, probably we get a local urban bundle and at the end of the day, suddenly the, the wireless technologies just continue like they want to at Telcom Falls. We've got about in excess of about six or seven thousand people in Telcom that's got no idea how our ideas all work. So they work in other divisions. So, uh, if you were running Telcom and your task was let's maximize the value of our ADSL offering, um, how would you go about doing that? Actually speaking from Satku's point of view, I wouldn't know what Telcom would do there, but uh, I'm under the impression that Telcom is uh, promoting ADSL two or three um, promotions that's running at the moment. What, what would you do about the speed, increasing the speed of ADSL? Regarding to increasing the speed on the network, the last mile needs to be tested and see if it conforms to regulation and to basically the equipment added to it. To the date we don't know if they can handle higher speeds because higher speeds comes with higher voltages. We do still have inferior technology or not inferior as such, we do still have paper cable to our SDC networks and even beyond. We don't know if that would basically conform. But, but what about your ADSL enabled uh, uh, loops? Couldn't you up the speed on that simply by software adjustment? <coughs> that I won't be able to answer that you have to ask the incumbent. <laughs> I would maybe just uh, throw a stone here in the dark and say, okay, um, relating to the questions, if I understand right what you guys want, uh, with respect to, uh, if we look at what part of the country is keeping Telcom afloat, and where the network uh, wireless operators want to jump into, where is the responsibility of the wireless operator? When Telcom needs to go into rural areas and provide service. Now we could probably get four meg in excess of four megas and all that in the north end, Bryanston and Benham Gardens. What about the rest of the country? So if a local loop is in Lando and uh, the other operators jump into the network, where are they going to operate? Only in the north end or in South Africa? But if you see the wireless operators as your competitors, they aren't they the biggest threat? So isn't there a basis then for Telcom to so improve its ADSL offering by increasing speeds, by uh, going head-to-head -head with the, the wireless operators, by 
bringing more internet service providers onto the network, increasing the number of uh, ADSL subscribers way beyond 760,000. Isn't that where, what the critical issue is? Because uh, in a way, it's, it's all hands on deck for ADSL, isn't it? Otherwise, that's going to be wiped out by um, the, the wireless operators. <coughs> Should compare Apple to Apple because that's why Telcom has launched ATA to compare to compete in the wireless arena. With regard to the ADSL, um, I have to come back to you on that. The I think the concern here is a is a very practical one. If Telcom has launched ATA to compete against the mobiles. What's going to happen to the rest of Telcom? Because the tel Telcom cannot stay Telcom Fix and Telcom ATA. Telcom Fix has to do something as well. And that is what that is what Councillor Curry is, is getting at. What else could Telcom Fix do to actually stay as a business? is not one of its options to get as many people using as much of its network as possible to get as much money out of its network as possible to stay afloat because otherwise your presumption is that the wireless will wipe out telecom fixed maybe to get to the previous question i understand it right is we need to look at the accountability and the responsibility if there's other operators that climb on our network uh not our network telcom network i'm from communications union who's going to carry the responsibility and accountability on the assurance of that cable if we are to grow adsl network uh and, and, and broadband we're doing it on a fixed line and if another operator two or three operators come onto our local loop. Who's going to look after the cable? Who's going to look after the copper? What's in it for the consumer? Who's going to carry the responsibility? Thank you. Isn't that where really your, uh, your union members would be uh, maintaining it? So if you increase the, the size of ADSL on the network, then your union members will have to maintain that because Telcom would then be leasing uh, local loops, let's say, in a bitstream form to the internet service providers um, and uh, charging them a wholesale rate for it. So you're increasing the amount of money coming into Telcom and you seeing that your, your copper network <coughs> is, is being utilized more effectively. But it's not necessarily a, a lose, a win lose situation. It, it can be a win win situation. Through you, Mr. Chair, we must take consideration that if the other network operator comes on our local loop, they're not going to seek for new customers, as we all know. They're going to take the existing customer. The existing customer is this customer that pays Telcom, that pays my workforce. But then why is the number increasing? As we've seen, the ADSL customers are increasing. So it's not just it's, it's a matter of the value to, to the whole network that, that we see here. Um, and, and, and what I'm putting to you is that, is there a way of looking at this differently? So it's not just me, Telcom, MWeb, or FNB Connect. It's like if we maximize the use of this, uh, then technicians are employed to maintain the network, You're increasing the network effects of ADSL in terms of its value proposition. And the ADSL value proposition is that it's a much more reliable form of uh, broadband connectivity. Uh, you, you can, um, uh, you don't have the, the problem of wireless networks where a sh everyone is sharing the cell and uh, <coughs> half the time you, you think you're getting 21 megabits per second download, but in reality, back on 330, kilobits per second. So there, there are definite values in ADSL over wireless competitors. So all we're saying is that uh, it would be, be 
good if, if, if the important union and, and their members were to think about the broader issue of how does one build and sustain an ADSL uh, offering network in the face of this competitive environment. Sarko is in the business of securing jobs for labor and making sure that the conditions are within the Labor Relations Act and that they adhere to. Your question with regard to the increasing of the numbers of the ADSL subscribers, that is due to the incumbent telecom going into different means of advertising, cutting their cost and marketing itself. We as a union do not run the company. The company runs themselves. We just make sure that our labor force is happy. Just to add to that, as, uh, with the increase of the ADSL customers, as we said in our submission, yeah, it is, uh, is a very big chunk of them. It's actually customers of Telcom was using 50 kb lines uh, modems that just converted to ADSL. It's very difficult to, to, dis, to, to define the, the actual growth of ADSL. You asked a rhetorical question just now about who takes responsibility and accountability for lines. I'd like to turn that around. We actually have questions for you. <coughs> Question number 16. In the case of physical line and bundling, whether copper fiber or otherwise, who should be responsible for the maintenance of the line? In the case of bitstream, question number 17. In the case of bitstream, who should be responsible for the maintenance of the customer line? These are questions we'd like you to ask rather than asking us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank should we ask you the questions or are you asking us the questions? We're asking you the questions. The responsibility lies with labor. <coughs> take care of it. Just an just input. The people that is looking at leasing or making use of a local loop unbundling and the close the after the exchange, do they have the relevant manpower or skilled manpower to do that? Or are they going to basically take from the incumbent or are they going to upskill? It's, let, let, let me turn it around slightly differently. If the access seeker paid Telcom a fair fee to maintain the line, is that a problem? Because if the line's being maintained, the service is upheld. Somebody has to maintain the line, and if that line just so happens to be Telcom, Telcom's only concern would be that it gets a fair price for that line. So, is there a labor problem with that environment? The fair fee that you are making mention of, who's going to determine that? The incumbent, or ICASA, or is a fee going to be basically suggested by other parties? Uh, the proposal by ICASA is that that fee be charged on a non-discriminatory basis. In other words, whatever Telcom Wholesale charges Telcom Retail, Telcom Wholesale charges the others. So it's up to Telcom's pricing to ensure that that price is fair. That's the proposal that ICASA has put forward in its document. So just in my humble view there, we must take consideration that all, let me imagine I'm Telcom and I've got a customer, and the customer is paying me in good money, I'm giving him a service, and I'm making money out of that customer. And now another service organization or operator comes to use my road towards my customer and takes my customer, and I charge him right of way. I'm not making money out of the customer anymore. Thank you. Do you have any questions from the floor?
Thank you very much, Duncan.